We are continuing with chapter 17 of the Bhagavad Gita. This is the penultimate chapter. And in this chapter we have been speaking about Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, aspects of various things. The nature of the mind, the kind of food, the kinds of worship. And it continues in this spirit to explain all aspects of our life. The gunas permeate all aspects of our life. Everything comes under the domain of the gunas. So we continue now with verses 14 to 19. And here we will discuss the different kinds of tapas, sacrifice or practice. Verses 14 to 19. Service to the deities, the twice born, the gurus and the wise men. Simplicity, purity, celibacy and non-violence are said to be physical ascetism. Speech that does not agitate, that is true, pleasant and beneficial, as well as the practice of self-study and japa is said to be the ascetism of speech. Clarity and pleasantness of mind, peacefulness, silence, total control of one's self, purification of sentiments. This is said to be mental ascetism. Those three kinds of ascetism undertaken by humans with supreme faith when they are not desiring the fruit and are joined in yoga are said to be the sattvic kinds with the purpose of gaining respect, honor and worship and out of hypocrisy the ascetism that is thus performed temporary and unstable is rajasic. That ascetism that is performed with stupefied comprehension and with pain or for the purpose of uprooting others, that is said to be sattvic, sorry, tamasic. So here we see the first classification of tapas, which is the Sanskrit word for ascetism. The first classification is physical, that of speech and mental. So we can practice some form of tapas, some sort of training or control or discipline in three ways. One at a physical level, the other at the level of speech and third is at a mental level. What is a tapas at a physical level? Celibacy, for example, that's a classical example of self-control or non-violence in different forms, whether it is physical non-violence or in behavior, being gentle, being kind, etc. That is also a physical aspect. Purity, simplicity, all these as well as service in different forms is considered to be a form of tapas at a physical level. At the level of speech, to be observant and to practice some sort of self-study of oneself and what we are talking about that is also considered to be ascetism speech. For example, sometimes certain students who are 
dissipating their energy by talking a lot. These are given the recommendation to practice mona. Mona is silence. That mona is a form of tapas. And that can be practiced also at different levels. You can take a very intense practice of mona where you do not even talk, you do not even look at a person, you do not even gesture, no body language, no sign language, no, no slips of paper with writing on it. That would be a very intense form of mona. That would be considered a form of tapas. Japa, that is a practice of um, repetition, mantra repetition, is also considered to be a form of tapas. So this form of tapas, training of the speech, is subtler than the tapas at a physical level. And subtler than this is that at a mental level. What is that kind of tapas? Is where you work at a at a level of purification. Now all of these are once again classified into those that are sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. You may have begun to notice the pattern. When you notice the pattern, you will realize that you can also distinguish between those forms of tapas that are tamasic and that which is sattvic. So that practice or tapas that is undertaken with supreme faith or with great deal of bhava, not with the particular desire of a, of a certain fruit or reward, that is considered to be sattvic. This is, of course, hard to understand, but we have referred to this in the earlier sessions when we talked about karma, where we said, imagine those of you who have a hobby, you do something, for example, gardening. Some of you may like to just read. Others like cooking. Some like to go for walks. These are hobbies. And we don't do these for a particular purpose. We do these simply because we love it. We enjoy it. It gives us a great deal of satisfaction. And so imagine doing sadhana, doing some practice, simply because you love it, because you long for it. That is sattvic form of tapas. Mostly, most of us don't always experience such a sattvic form of tapas or self-training. Very often, it is mixed with a slight rajasic element. So we may perform some sort of tapas or sadhana with the aim of getting some respect. That which is performed out of sheer hypocrisy, you know, just to pretend. Or that which is very unstable, you do it one day and then you don't do it for the next 10 days, that is considered to be all rajasic form of tapas. The last is that kind of tapas which is performed in a very stupefied manner. This means that it is done out of ignorance. There is no clear understanding behind that form of tapas. We have heard about tapasvin or, or uh, ascetics who have performed things which, which amount to self-torture. You know, they do terrible things. 
Some of you may have heard about these things like a man who held his hand up um, high up, you know, uh, until the entire arm atrophied. You know, the, the whole arm sort of withered away. It was just a dried stump. That entire arm just atrophied. The muscles atrophied and the whole entire arm was useless because he held his arm up for years. And this is a, almost a form of self-torture, which is not recommended by the texts, the, the yogic scriptures. Such a tapas would be considered tamasic. There are also traditions in India where practices are done for the purpose of hurting others. It's a form of black magic. And one can use prayer, chanting, mantras with evil intentions. Such a sadhana or such tapas is also tamasic. So in this way, the Bhagavad Gita classifies practice or tapas. As we will continue, you will see that almost everything can be classified like this. And this gives us a great deal of understanding. Because not all sadhana is useful or beneficial. If it is done with the wrong intention, it's tamasic. So the endeavor should be, in whatever you do, to have a sattvic sadhana or practice some sattvic form of tapas. Questions, thoughts, comments on this? Okay, in that case, we continue to verses 20 to 22. These verses talk about charity, gifts or donations. So verse 20 says, One ought to give the charity that is given thus to someone incapable of returning the favor that is given at the right place and time towards someone worthy, that charity is remembered as sattvic. That which is given with the purpose of gaining a return or aiming at a fruit or given with distress, that charity is remembered as rajasic. That which is given at an inappropriate place or time to those unworthy, without respect and insultingly, that charity is said to be tamasic. Why this specific mention of charity done? For those who are on the path of yoga, learning to be selfless includes learning to do some form of charity. And throughout the world, all the traditions of the world, charity is a very important aspect. In fact, there is a kind of a hand rule which goes as one should donate approximately 10% of your income. This comes from a very, very old tradition when most societies were farm, farming-based societies, agricultural societies. And every year, the farmer 
had to keep one tenth of his land fallow. That means 10% of all the land that he would normally plow, he would keep fallow. To keep fallow means not to plow, not to grow anything on that land. So 10% would always be left aside. Why was that? That was to allow the land to regenerate. Because if you would keep plowing and harvesting from that land, at some point of time, the land would become barren. So there was always a system of rotation. And this tradition of keeping that 10% aside, in a sense, to give to the divine, was carried forward <clears throat> in all the other aspects of life. And so the idea of 10%, giving 10% in charity, has become a kind of a benchmark. However, what happens is that most people do not want to part with what they have. Everybody thinks that, oh, somebody else has more money, he should do charity, I don't need to do charity. And this is a form of selfishness. Learning to give is a very, very important part of the process of developing and on the journey of going within. It's learning to let go of things, learning to give, to be generous and not to be a miser. Just remember that the word misery and miser are related. They are related to each other. So that charity is sattvic when the donation or that gift is given to somebody who may not be able to even return your favor and to somebody who is worthy. It should also be given at right time and place. After all, <clears throat> sometimes you can imagine if charity is given to somebody who is not worthy, that it can be also misused. If you see value in something and you want to express your appreciation, if you want to show somebody respect for what he or she is giving, sharing, doing, then one gives to a worthy cause. So this is a sattvic charity. But what if we give something with the intention of getting something in return? That is Rajasik. I think all of us know this idea. In corporations, you know, in business, they always send, at the end of the year, they will send a greeting card. Or, you know, in India, they send Diwali cards to business partners. And as long as he's a business partner, they send you a card. But the day you're no longer the business partner, you don't send a card. This idea is, in a very subtle way, sending greeting cards for a reason. That's not charity, but it's a gift of some form. Or even giving gifts to somebody because you want something in return. This can also be considered to be a bribe. It's just another word for bribe. Rajasik donation is nothing other than a bribe. Or giving a gift um, under pressure, feeling that you have to give it because uh, everybody else is giving something. That would be a very Rajasik uh, 
form of charity. And then comes the sattvic one. So that which is given to those who really are undeserving or given in a very insulting manner because, you know, you don't really want to give it, you just give it in a way that's, that's actually very disrespectful. That is a tamasic charity. In the yogic path, teachers like myself, we have often experience different forms that, that people give and uh, we see sometimes people who are giving purely because uh, they feel they have to give, they don't really want to and others who give purely to, to support what we are doing here and, and giving even when they maybe not, don't have a lot of money because they really value this and that is a very, very sattvic form of giving. So these verses talk about charity, which is not merely about money. It can also be in the form of um, work, for example. You can do voluntary work somewhere. You can give your time. That is also a form of charity. You can give in kind. You can give things, goods, material. You can do physical work. There is a tradition in India of having in temples, for example, um, food is given free to the poor. So people can give the kitchen food. They can give them sacks of grain or food or, or things as, as, as charity. Or you can offer your time, you can work in the kitchen. Also, that's possible. So these are different forms of charity. It's not only about money or gifts. It can be done in other forms. In the form of material goods, in the form of time, effort. And these aspects. And learning to give it's a very important part of this inner journey, journey towards self-transformation. Any questions about the three kinds of charity? Yes, Manisha. When we are offered a gift, well, that's always nice, you know. The world around us is a gift. And we receive in many different ways. But very often, we close ourselves to these gifts. We don't realize that these are just beautiful gifts. And are in our modern life... We have mostly been taught to be independent. We have taught to be self-sufficient. And sometimes we do not wish to receive help. We do not wish, wish to receive uh, support. We do not wish to receive uh, even guidance. So gifts can come to us in different forms. And we, we should develop an attitude also to receive, not just to give, but also to receive. Most of the time, we are told, oh, you have to accept the bad things in life. That's a part of life. And somehow it seems that most seekers begin to think, 
that they have to accept the, the bad things, the, the difficult things, the suffering and the misery. But they forget to learn to accept and receive the good things. I can give you a very simple example. If somebody gives you a compliment, are you able to accept that gracefully? Most people have difficulty with that. They don't know how to react. If you tell somebody, oh, you, you look beautiful, you, you have great, uh, you know, great eyes, or you're very talented, you have a lovely voice, then they begin to look all awkward and embarrassed. That's because there is a part of you that's not open to receiving the good things in life. So learning to receive gifts is also a very, very important aspect of growing on this spiritual path. I often say to those of you who are very close to me that it's very important to embrace even the good things, the wonderful things in life. Most of the time, we are always saying, I have to accept all the bad stuff, you know, I have to accept it, I have to go through this, life is tough. But life is also beautiful. And when you get a gift, embrace it, accept it, and express gratitude for it. And when I say express gratitude for it, it does not mean necessarily express gratitude to the person. It may come through. A gift or the gifts of life may come through a person. But if you cultivate this bhava, this attitude of gratitude, then you have this gratitude to life, to the divine. And all good things will come unto you. Thank you for that question, Manisha. That was actually a very, very um, nice little twist on giving, also receiving. Verses 23 to 27. Om Tat Sat. Om, that is reality. This is the threefold statement concerning Brahman. From this the Brahmanas, the Vedas and the sacrifices were produced in the ancient past. Therefore, all the sacrifices, charities and ascetic acts of those proficient in the knowledge of Brahman, performed according to the ordinance, are commenced daily after enunciating Om Das. After enunciating Tat, that, without the intention of fruit, the sacrificial and the ascetic acts and various acts of charity, performed by those desiring liberation. The word Sat, reality, is used to express reality as well as goodness. Also, the word Sat is used to express a praiseworthy act, O son of Pritha. Stability in sacrifice, ascetism and charity is also called Sat. Also, any act for the purpose of these is called Sat alone. <clears throat> Om Tat Sat is like a little mantra and it actually captures all of reality. Om is the mystical word Pranav and this expresses the three states of consciousness and the fourth that is beyond. Om is a subject by itself 
and very soon in the next weeks when we have completed the Bhagavad Gita we will start with the three principal Upanishads the Isha Upanishad, the Mandukya Upanishad and the Mundaka Upanishad the Mandukya Upanishad is an entire Upanishad of 12 verses actually one of the shortest Upanishads entirely about Om, the mantra Om and we will go into great depth understanding the meaning, the true meaning of Om the sound Om Understanding this knowledge, understanding the meaning of Om and gaining that knowledge is one of the finest um, form of tapas. It gives you comprehensive knowledge of Brahman, of the universe, of the different planes of existence. That on the other hand, means that it is once again indicating that reality which is constant, which is eternal and imperishable. The website that I have that first takes its name from Tat, which means that. Sat is still another word to express that same reality. All these are different words basically for one and the same. Um, Manisha, I just saw the question. I continued. I did not realize that you had uh, another question there. And your question is, can you know the intention, um, meaning Rajas, Tamas, uh, the intention behind the gift, I, I presume, uh, so that you receive a gift, the intention behind the gift. Is that what you mean? Well, if you are sharp enough, if your buddhi has been well trained, and if you're sharp enough, then you will know. And of course, I understand um, that you do, do not know whether you should accept a gift or not. I would say in general, the focus should be on learning to accept gifts because that itself is a challenge. I have seen that most of us are so blocked and have so much, so many difficulties accepting the good things that it takes a while just to unlearn that habit pattern. So we should learn, focus on learning to accept the good part of life, the good things in life. So initially, I think uh, part of that process would be to merely accept gifts or learning to accept gifts. Eventually, as the buddhi gets sharper, you may see that a certain gift is tamasic, a certain gift is rajasic, and a certain gift is sattvic. And then it is merely a matter of your own personal decision whether you want to accept it or not. If a gift is rajasic and you are expected to do something in return, which would, for example, go against your values, then I think it's best not to accept the gift. But if there is no harm in you returning the gift, then why not? You can do that. This is a matter of how you read the situation and in that moment you might 
decide in one way or the other. There are no hard and fast rules. You see, rules are, yoga is not about rules. That makes you a very limited person following rules. So the idea is to develop a sharp buddhi and then you would know how to respond. Those people who want rules on how to respond uh, or to behave or have strategies, they are not observing, they are not open. So that's why it's important that first learn to accept gifts of life and then as you develop your buddhi, you will know how to respond to different kinds of gifts, whether they are sattvic, whether they are rajasic or they are tamasic. Okay? So the very last verse in this chapter says, An offering made Charity given, ascetic observation, observance undertaken, or whatever act performed without faith is called asat, untrue, unreal, or evil. It bears nothing, neither here nor after death. O son of Pritha. <laughs> yes, bye bye, Roseanne. <laughs> These verses say very clearly that tamasic actions in the form of, you know, sadhana, tamasic form of sadhana or practice does nothing to help you here nor hereafter. So if you Start performing charity or some sort of tapas, but if you don't do it in a sattvic manner, then you do not get much merit out of it. It is best not to do such practices or such sadhana. Better to refrain than to do something which is totally tamasic. So if you were, I know nobody is planning to do that, but if one of you were contemplating to do some sort of self-torturing tapas, then as per this verse, it would be recommended. Better do nothing than to do that. If you are going to do something, then... Do it in a sattvic spirit. Do it with the right bhava. And when you do it with the right bhava, the merit will accrue to you, as it is utterly useless. So that was the last verse in this chapter. Any comments or questions about this chapter? The entire chapter, if you have anything that you want to talk about. Well, then in that case, we go now to the very last chapter, chapter 18. So the amazing text, the Bhagavad Gita now drawing to an end. The final chapter is called Moksha Sanyas Yoga. Moksha means liberation, final liberation from the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. Sanyasa means non-attachment 
Sannyasa has also other meanings and we will go into that shortly. This chapter, the very last chapter, continues the trend of the previous two chapters and speaks about the gunas in greater detail. It also mentions the three kinds of sannyasa or renunciations, the three kinds of actions, the three kinds of knowledge, the three kinds of buddhi, and three kinds of happiness or sukha, the nature of men, the duties, all of which have three modes or three kinds or qualities. This clarifies that everything falls under the domain of gunas. There is no escape from the gunas. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 18. Arjuna said, O mighty armed one, I wish to know the essence of renunciation and of relinquishing the fruits. O Lord of senses, destroyer of sin. The blessed Lord said, The wise have known that abandoning the desire of fulfilling observances is renunciation. The insight for one says that relinquishing the fruits of all action is relinquishing. This question is really referring to an ancient debate. There are two parts. That is one of renunciation and the other of householder. And one wants to know which one is superior. Essentially, it is a question about Tiaga and Vairagya. The word sannyas or renunciation is a more general term. In, the, in modern times, we use the word sannyas in different ways. Very often we are thinking of a sannyasi, somebody who has taken vows of renunciation and he has done tiaga. He has given up physical objects. He has given up home, he has given up family, he's given up money, wealth. So this is tiaga. And that's what we understand in our modern times as sannyasa. But sannyasa is, according to the Bhagavad Gita, much higher, a broader term. It means vairagya. It means not necessarily renouncing the physical objects, but renouncing the desire for these physical objects. So, sannyasa, according to the Bhagavad Gita, is somebody who is a paramvairagi, someone who is established in the state of complete non-attachment. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita, as well as other ancient texts, also refer to the very last stage of life as sannyasashram. Renunciation is not done in the beginning, but at the end of life, when one has enjoyed all those worldly objects and no longer craves for them, no longer has a desire for these worldly objects. And so, over time, naturally, one has acquired a bit of vairagya. And therefore, in that very last stage of life, 
When you have acquired vairagya, it is very easy to do tiyaga, to give up the physical objects. It's important to understand this distinction between tiyaga and vairagya. In tiyaga, you may give up the physical object, but the desire for the object may still remain in your mind. For example, if you decide today that you have been eating too many sweets and chocolates and ice creams and all these kind of things, and you say, I'm going to give them up, I'm going to renounce them, then you're doing tiaga. You may, however, have a craving for chocolate and ice cream. But if you can work on that craving in such a manner that one fine day, even the desire for chocolate and ice cream is gone. You don't really crave for it anymore. You have a more normal relationship with it. You can enjoy it once in a while then, but you don't crave for it. That would be Vairagya. And then you say, okay, then I have it once in a while if I want, and if I don't want, I don't have it. You are free. You are free to make a choice. And Tiaga, you're not free. You have imposed it on yourself, some external form of force on yourself. While Vairagya is an internal renunciation. That's the distinction between the two. So verses 3 to 6, if everybody is clear about the difference between Tiaga and Vairagya and has understood that in the Bhagavad Gita the word sannyasa is used to mean Vairagya, though in modern times we use the sannyasa, word sannyasa to mean somebody who takes vows of renunciation. That's clear? Or would Anybody like clarification? Are there any questions about that? It's a heated debate since many thousands of years. I don't think we are going to solve that uh, debate or resolve this, but if you have uh, something that you would like to clarify about this. Okay, good. Everybody is fine with that. Verses 3 to 6. Some contemplative thinkers say that action should be abandoned like a fault. Others say that sacrifice, charity and ascetic actions cannot be relinquished or renounced. In this regard, hear my determination concerning relinquishment or renunciation. O best of Bharatas, O tiger among men, relinquishment or renunciation indeed is of three kinds. Sacrifice, charity and asceticism. These acts should not be abandoned. Indeed, they must be done. Sacrifice, charity and asceticism are purifiers the contemplative and the wise. Even these acts, however, should be performed after abandoning fruits. O oh, Sanaprita, this is my definite view. So, we hear once again that one should perform some sort of sacrifice. The word sacrifice does not always mean ritual. It is a broader term, it means sadhana, it means worship, it means internal worship. It could mean rituals. One should perform 
charity and some sort of self-training or self-control. These should not be abandoned. But they should also not be performed with the view of gaining some fruit or reward. So, if you perform these actions, which you should, then do it selflessly. Do it because you enjoy doing it. Grow into it. Cultivate that habit. The next verse is continue. Therefore, I will just read uh, further. Verses 7 to 9 are also about renunciation. It is not appropriate to renounce the eternal act. I think there's a mistake here. It means external act. It's not appropriate to renounce the external act. To abandon that out of delusion is said to be tamasic. If one abandons an act because it is difficult and out of fear of discomfort to the body, upon committing such rajasic abandonment, one would not gain the result of abandoning. The act that is ever performed because it ought to be done, O Arjuna, giving up attachment as well as fruit, such renunciation is considered sattvic. So, once again, three kinds of renunciation. The first one is giving up all external action. This is considered tamasic. Some of you may know the story of Sant Gnaneshwar, who was a Maharashtrian saint from the 13th century, I think it was. He uh, is one of the most um, famous Maharashtrian saints from Maharashtra, a part of India. And his father, Vithalpanth, left his wife and his four children, abandoned the family and went off to become a swami or a sannyasi. When his teacher found out quite accidentally that Vittalpant was actually married and had children, he sent him back because it is considered to be wrong to do this. One cannot renounce the world when you have responsibilities and duties to perform. That was a tamasic renunciation. And he was sent back by his teacher to his family. If you abandon action and say, I want to renounce everything, simply because it's difficult, you know, you can't cope with things in life, you want to escape, you want to just leave the world. You know, that is escapism, that's not renunciation. So, renunciation out of fear, renunciation out of escapism is rajasic in nature. The finest form of renunciation is that in which you give up the attachment as well as attachment to the fruit. You do, do the action, perform the action selflessly because it has to be done. It's a form of duty. Unfortunately, these days, we consider duty to be a burden. So we do our duty very reluctantly and our duties do not enrich us, do not enliven us. Our duties are so heavy and bothersome that we only want to escape from them. So this is naturally not the spirit of performing duties. Perform your duties lovingly and cultivate that 
just as we talked about the hobbies. Perform all your action as if it were a hobby, something you enjoy doing. If you enjoy gardening or you enjoy cooking, then perform all your actions in the same spirit. Of course, easier said than done. So, any thoughts, questions about this? So as you can see that this chapter continues along the same lines and analyzes all actions and in a sense synthesizes everything under this umbrella of gunas of Tamas Rajasan Sattva. Yeah, the question is I should continue or should we stop here? Yes, the next ones are explaining the the actions. The actions are also threefold. <clears throat> okay. Maybe we we stop here at this point and continue next time. Anybody has any questions so far or any comments so far? No? No one? Okay, in that case we stop here and we'll continue next time Take it from here. so I wish everybody a, a nice weekend same to you thank you yeah. bye bye everyone bye bye everyone thank you bye bye Manisha Bye, Surabi. Bye, Shibu. Bye, Debbie. Bye. <laughs> bye. 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 Bye, Gautam. <laughs>